Uh, this time we are going over uh, the very disparate genres uh, that have been kind of coagulated into this term modernism uh, by our book, uh, by our resource. Um, and once again, let's go over kind of our timeline here. Uh, we've got Gothic. Uh, we've got Renaissance. Uh, Renaissance being 14th, 15th century. Uh, we get um, Baroque, which is 16th. Uh, well, let's say Renaissance is 15th, 16th. Baroque is 16th, 17th, 18th. Uh, and then uh, along with Rococo, uh, we have Neoclassical. And we have Romantic. Right. And then we have um, our Impressionists. Oops. We have Impressionism. And then we have our Post-Impressionism, which, as we talked about last time, is kind of a amalgamation of different styles. Uh, and then we are getting into modernism, which includes quite a lot, um, uh, which includes uh, Fauvism, uh, which includes Cubism, uh, it includes Dada, uh, it includes, let's see here, what else do we want to talk about? Uh, we have Expressionism, uh, which includes uh, the schools of... Uh, the uh, die die Bruca and der blau rider um we have abstraction which uh, which then will form abstract expressionism as well will kind of come together um and then we have uh the harlem renaissance uh which is kind of an event not necessarily a, a genre um we have the ready maids um and then lastly uh oh well, maybe not last so we have surrealism uh, and then we have Bauhaus, kind of the main ones we want to focus on here quite a lot. Um, so let's go ahead and get into it, uh, starting with Fauvism. Um, and so uh, the first group here uh, is um, uh, utilizes uh, the post-impressionist uh, idea of kind of pushing the boundaries of color. Uh, uh, use post-impressionists I want to present this ideas of pushing uh, the boundaries of color right we get uh, the group known as the Fauves which is also known as Fauvism right uh, and they utilize a, a lot of what's called arbitrary color uh, I don't think I'm supposed to have the quotations here. Uh, arbitrary color being color that's not seen in the real world, right? Not not optical color, right? Optical color being the color you see in the real world. Uh, Fauves meaning the wild beasts, right? And the major uh, Fauvist is Henry Matisse. Uh, Henry Matisse lives from 1869 to 1954. Okay. Um, he uses colors so intense uh, that they violate kind of the sensibilities of the critics of, and public alike. Right. Um, and they're taking their cue especially from Van Gogh. Uh, who, uh, you know, used the use of yellow, especially, right? It's kind of like this way that he perceived colors. Uh, and Matisse says, instead of the way we see colors, let's just use some wild colors, right? And here's a Matisse painting. Uh, I had to get a painting of a cat. Uh, it, is, it is the only logical painting I can have. Um, but yeah, that is a Matisse right there. Look, I mean, the colors, you know, yeah, you do have green there. The blue of the water looks very green, All right? Which you can, you, you know... You can actually see water. The sky is blue, uh, but the you know the walls are all very much uh, out there in terms of color, right? Uh, and may, you know maybe that is the color of all of these things, but not quite, right? Maybe it is, uh, you know, um, kind of like an approximation in a way, right? Okay. So uh, just like we had, so the post-impressionists somewhere were using kind of a, a borderline arbitrary color. Um, but we also had some post-impressionists really uh, trying to attack form, right? 
Um, and we see in the modern era, right, we also see natural form attacked as well. Uh, natural form is uh, a attacked and pretty much wiped out uh, by a particular group, um, especially in Paris around the year 1908. Okay, uh, and it is mostly done by two artists. Uh, that is Pablo Picasso. Everybody knows him. And Georges Brock. Apollo Picasso living from 1881 to 1973. George Brock, then from 1882 to 1963. Okay. Um, uh, they work together uh, and they develop a whole new system of art. Um, and they develop. Okay, they, uh, um, they analyze form in new ways. And that new style is going to be known as Cubism. Okay. Um, so what really influenced Picasso and Brock is actually psychology. Uh, and so we had seen during this time period uh, that psychologists have posited that uh, human experience is much vi more vibrant and much richer than can be gathered from a traditional painting. Um, and because a traditional painting uh, um, can only show one perspective. A uh, human experience not captured uh, in painting because it only shows, um, only shows one vantage point, only shows one perspective. Right. Um, and so um, they talk about when we look at any given scene, we remember the scene as an overlay of visual impression seen from different angles and moments in time, right? So when you're, when you, you know, when you're able to visualize something, right, we, we see it from different angles, right? Uh, uh, it, or like our, our, the way our eyes work, right? Uh, we don't necessarily see from one perspective, right? We're seeing from multiple, if not infinite at the same time, right? Right. And so, um, what's, what Picasso and Brock did to kind of confirm that they knew these theories, uh, they would uh, break figures up into multiple overlapping uh, perspectives. Okay, um, as we can see here, uh, hopefully we can see here, uh, in this painting, uh, oh, excuse me, uh, this is also another uh, Fauvist painting. Um, but here is Guernica, uh, probably Picasso's most famous painting, right? You're seeing, you're, you're, especially look at this bull right here, right? You're seeing both eyes of the bull, even though, you know, if you kind of looked at it from the side, you wouldn't be able to, right? So it's kind of, it's, it's almost like you're looking at it in different angles in the same painting, right? You're looking at it head on, you're looking at it from the side, right? Um, so that's what they're trying to do uh, with cubism, right? Um, and here's an example of a Brock painting, which is much more abstract in its subject, right? Um, but kind of, again, gets the point across that uh, you're looking for different perspectives, right, of the same painting, right? Okay. Um, so uh, they're also highly influenced by African art. Right, they're heavily influenced by African art, um, which they believed to be closer to nature uh, than European art. Which may have a colonial sentiment behind it, right? Um, and so uh, they are especially reacting to the kind of naturalistic, uh, sentimental artworks uh, of the of the late nineteenth century. Right, um, in early twentieth century, uh, and as we could tell, right, they form they they prefer abstract figures uh, over lifelike. All right, so that's cubism. 
Um, and then, so when we go to Germany, right, we see an art uh, that emphasizes emotional response. Okay. Um, and we have a group of artists, uh, which I'm going to bundle, I'm going to bungle the, uh, the pronunciation here, uh, Dia Bruca, the umlauts. Um, so Die Brücke is the movement, which includes uh, Ludwig Kirchner and uh, Emil Nold. Kirchner living from 1880 to 1938. And Emil Nold living from 1867 to 1956. Um, almost directly with Henry. He lives exactly the same age as Henry Matisse, right? Just two years uh, older than him, right? Um, and so what they are doing is they took uh, the brilliant arbitrary colors of the Fauvists, uh, took Fauvist, which is Henry Matisse, uh, arbitrary colors, and combined them with the f intense feelings of the Norwegian artist Edvard Munch, uh, which I did not uh, pull a piece of artwork from Edvard Munch, but if you know what the scream is, that is his most famous painting, right? The the man screaming on the bridge, uh, who lives from 1863 to 1944. Okay, so they combine those two things together. Um, and so, uh, this kind of attempt to, um, um, let's see here, how do I write this, uh, this attempt to make the inner, inner workings of the mind visible in art, uh, sorry, making, uh, inner, uh, the inner workings of the mind visible in art. is known as uh, Expressionism. Okay, so these are the first Expressionist artists. Ex expre Man, I am uh, struggling with writing lately, huh? Uh, writing a lot, I guess. Might do that to you. Uh, expressionism. Okay. Um, let's take a look at some of their art before we move on. Okay. Um, so here you have uh, a painting of Ludwig Kirchner. Right, and you can almost feel the kind of sentiments going on uh, here in their in their faces. Uh, I tried to find a really good example to kind of show the try to, in the inner workings of the mind, right? But it, it looks like they're like, you know, they're going along with their day. It looks like they're just kind of uh, um, unfocused, right? You see the hollow eyes, right? They're just kind of going along with their lives, right? Uh, and you maybe see a little sadness in the child down here. Uh, and then here you have a painting of Emil Nold, uh, where you can kind of see almost his blank expression, right? Like like the this this woman is a million miles away, right? Um, at least that's what I'm seeing, right? Um, and so uh, another expressionist group, right? Which so let's go ahead and just label these guys these kind of German movements as expressionism, right? Um, is uh, the group known as uh, Der Blau Reiter. Der Blau Reiter, or Reiter. Uh, and it's actually, even though it's German, it's led by the Russian artist uh, Vasily Kandinsky. Who will live from, um, who will live from 1866 to 1944? Okay, um, and in 1913, uh, Kandinsky will begin to paint totally abstract pictures.
right? Without any real subject. Okay. Um, and so uh, some other, and so this is uh, kind of known as abstraction, right? The And so uh, we see the abstract expressionism will come out of this kind of combination. Uh, abstract expressionism being very important going forward as a major, major art field, right? Uh, some other painters of abstraction include uh, Kazimir Malevich, a Russian. Uh, uh, Kazimir Malevich and the Dutch painter Piet Mondrian. With Malevich living from 1878 to 1935. And Mondrian living from 1872 to 1944. 1944, a rough year for artists with Munch, Kandinsky, and Mondrian all passing away that year, right? Um, and Mondrian is most known for his De Stiel canvases, um, which are, uh, his De Stiel canvases are these flat fields of primary colors. Uh, and are very much known is like a hallmark of modern art. Like when people think of modern art, they tend to think of these types of paintings. Uh, let's take a look at some of these here. Okay, uh, this is a Kandinsky art piece. Again, this complete abstraction of, of any subject, right? Uh, here you can see a Malevich painting and uh, here is a Mondrian painting, right? So the kind of just color fields of primary colors, right? um uh you know is is really i feel like people tend to attune to this when they think of kind of modern art right it has no subject right it's pure abstract geometric you know uh, uh color right uh so that's uh the abstraction and expressionist and abstract expressionism uh i shouldn't say that yet right we will get to abstract expressionism in our next section but this is kind of the beginning of that um but the next section that we're going to talk about, sorry, I had to crack my, my hands there. I've been, been writing a lot. Um, and then we see the beginnings of modern art in the United States. So we, we've really focused on art mostly, frankly, and in, in, in lately in France, right? We do see a breakdown to Germany. Uh, by the way, uh, I should mention uh, Malevich is Russian and Piet Mondrian is Dutch, right? Um, but we see the United States finally uh, uh, come around, right? And so what we see is uh, these beginnings that we're going to talk about, the arm, which I'm going to go ahead and spoil. It's the Armory Show. Uh, the Armory Show plus uh, World War One will eventually lead to have an effect uh, that leads to the shift of the center of the art world from Paris to New York. Right. Um, uh, and so the U.S. is unaffected by modern art uh, until 1913. Uh, which is when we have the first armory show. Or the armory show, I should say. The armory show, which lasts from uh, February 17th through March 15th of uh, 1913, right? Um, it is arranged by the Barnes Foundation. Okay. Um, and is the first major showing of modern art in the US. Okay, um, and it caused a sensation, right? Um, and the artwork shown here, let's go over here. Um, artworks shown here uh, were to become landmarks uh, of various European art movements.
of Euro art movements. Right. So they were just like signals to the American artists about what these new uh, uh, art styles are. And some of the examples here are uh, Marcel Duchamp's. Uh, we'll talk about Marcel Duchamp a little bit more, so I'm not going to bold him just yet. Uh, but two of his famous pieces, uh, which is, um, uh, you know what? Um, let's actually go back here. I'm going to put him in blue at this point because we also have his his birth and death. Uh, so Marcel Duchamp, who lives from 1887 to 1968, uh, a, a, a mythical figure in, in modern art. Um, he has two pieces that go here, a uh, nude descending a staircase. Um, and oh, I'm sorry, he only has one. I apologize. Uh, which is made in 1912. And uh, Picasso's uh, Les Dem Demoiselles d'Avignon. Oops, I don't want blue anymore. I want white. We already talked about Picasso, right? Um, uh, let's see here. Les Demoiselles. Demoiselles uh, d'Avignon. Which I believe translates to something like the women of Avignon. Uh, which is in 19, he makes in 1907. Uh, shocked viewers. Okay. Um, so let's see here. Let's go like this. Uh, and we'll go like that. Uh, shocked viewers. Uh, with challenging approaches to figure in space. Okay, um, and then uh, we also have uh, a artist known as Brancusi, who we don't really talk about too much. This is the only time we will talk about him, actually. Uh, Brancusi uh, made uh, The Kiss, uh, which was painted in, uh, or sorry, they don't not give us the date for that. They give us the date for, him, for Brancusi, which is 1876 through 1957. Okay, uh, but the kiss uh, has abstract block-like figures. Uh, this is a, a piece of sculpture. Uh, block-like figures. Uh, and then we also have Kandinsky's paintings make its way over as well. Uh, non -objective, his non-objective paintings, right? Again, there's no subject to his paintings. Uh, added to the outrage, right? Let's take a look at some of this artwork here. Um, there we go. So this is Nude Descending a Staircase from Duchamp, right? It, yeah, it's hard to see exactly, but, you know, it's there. Uh, here is Picasso's uh, Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, which is in the resource, right? Very famous painting, very famous example of, of the Cubist movement. Right, you can again, again kind of see the different perspectives on the faces here, especially right. Um, and then here we have Bron uh The Kiss. Right, um, again, very, very kind of abstract figures, barely people, but you can tell they're people. Right. Okay. All right. So while the Armory Show is really moving along uh, the American modern art style. Uh, there is a, a new American movement underway uh, in the 1920s. Uh, the Harlem Renaissance, right? So we see Harlem as a center uh, for African American art and music and writing. Right. Uh, especially fueled by the popularity of jazz. One of the most quintessential African American art style, um, and this whole uh, the the uh, we have writers and artists and musicians kind of move to to Harlem, uh, uh, join in a flowering of the arts 
that again altogether is known as the Harlem Renaissance. Okay. Um, uh, it, it, it's an inspiration to many artists and it inspires especially uh, two artists that they point out. Uh, Jacob Lawrence and uh, Romare, Romare Bearden. And even in their art, uh, you can even see some of the mo the examples of the movements we have talked about previously, right? Um, so we're almost seeing kind of that cubist possible look here, right? Um, cubist, uh, uh, maybe even fauvist, right? With the with the different colors, right? But you're also seeing kind of a a recall of the kind of traditional colors of Africa as well uh, in this artwork by Lawrence, uh, and then you here have Bearden with uh, it's not abstract, but it's certainly it's maybe a surrealist we would say. Right, um, but you can see kind of examples of like conflict going over here. Right, you can very clearly see examples of the Middle Passage, a Spanish flag, right, bringing slaves over, uh, possibly slaves revolting on the ship. Right, maybe a statue crumbling. You see a noose. Right, there's a lot going on in this artwork over uh, by Bearden. Right, uh, this is all heavily influenced by the Harlem Renaissance. Right. All right, moving out of the United States um, and out of World War One. Right or during World War One? Oops, I thought I might be in blue. Uh, uh, during uh, World War One and its aftermath. Right, we see uh, another movement uh, that is that questions the ideas of art, uh, the Dada movement, and the the term Dada is explicitly and purposefully nonsensical. Right. Um, uh, uh, in Zurich, Switzerland, right? Um, and it grew out of the angst of, of artists who were disillusioned with the war. So disillusioned. Nope, I misspelled it. Of course I did. Disillusioned uh, with the war, right? Um, and so, uh, and so Dada is an art that is trying to protest basically everything in society, right? Uh, protest. They say anything, so I'm going to say everything. Right? Protest everything in society, right? Uh, oh, no, they didn't say anything. Uh, and also, are there to ridicule uh, accepted kind of values and norms of society? Uh, uh, Basically, kind of like a edgy art style, right? Just like everything is is broken in the society, which is fair coming out of World War One, right? World War One very much broke an entire generation of artists and writers and thinkers. Um, and the most famous of the Dada's is actually a guy we talked about up here, Marcel Duchamp. Uh, he's kind of the founder of it, uh, in a way, and on accident. Um, and uh, he kind of represents the, uh, he has two artworks that they talk about being amusing and irreverent. It uh, creates amusing and irreverent. Irreverent being like no respect for, uh, uh, you know, the, the art world that came before it and society at large. Uh, and those two are going to be uh, Luke. L H O O K Q uh, and uh, Fountain. Uh, Luke being made in 1919, Fountain being made in 1917, and Fountain is really the beginning of Dada, the Dada movement. Um, Luke being a mustache on the Mona Lisa. and a uh, fountain being a porcelain urinal. Uh, the story of Fountain, uh, so it goes, is that he uh, he was supposed to be part of the salon, right? The French salon, again, which presents artwork to kind of the, the wealthy patrons uh, so that maybe uh, artists can get supported. Uh, and he kind of forgot about it. And so he rolled out of bed and went to a pawn shop and bought a urinal and displayed it at the salon, right? Let's take a look at those artworks. Here's Luke. 
uh, Tableau Dada, right? Tableau Nothing, essentially. Uh, and that's literally, again, a copy, a print of the Mona Lisa with a mustache and beard painted on it. Uh, and then here is the fountain uh, with the signature R. Mutt on its right kind of uh, mutt kind of representing this like person without a uh you know a home kind of idea right um and duchamp actually invents a whole new uh style of art with the fountain especially uh known as the ready maids uh so ready maids are kind of this collage idea right you take an ordinary object Um, and you give it new context. Right, that is what a ready-made is about. Um, and the key thing about ready-mades and Duchamp in general, and I guess Dada, right, is that it challenges uh, challenge traditional ways of how art functions. Right. Um, and, and, and instead of making a work of art, right, uh, this, they argue that, especially these ready-mades, right, an object becomes a work of art because the artist decide, decided uh, it is. Uh, through uh, artist's choice. Right, really, really moving us rapidly into the idea that anything can be art, right? Um, uh, the other major kind of ready-made maker of the time uh, is gonna be Picasso, um, which makes sense that he would also, right, kind of be in this thing. Uh, and uh, especially with his artwork, uh, Bull's Head, Uh, which he made in 1943, uh, which is literally just a bicycle handlebars uh, and bicycle seat uh, that he made look like a uh, look like a bull's head. Okay, um, so uh, let's now talk about uh, another genre of art. We're getting towards the end here, uh, very briefly. Um, the Surrealists. Uh, so Surrealists are influenced heavily by the psychological teachings of Freud. Um, and uh, they attempt to portray uh, the inner workings of the mind. Uh, very similar to uh, uh, the Cubists, right? In that way, in that kind of attempt, in that, in what they're attempting to do, but their art ends up looking nothing like uh, the uh, Cubists. Uh, we have Salvador Dali's, uh, absolutely the most famous of them. Uh, but also uh, Rene Magritte and Jean Miro. Uh, with uh, Dolly living from 1904 to 1989, uh, Rene Magritte living from 1898 to 1967, and Jean Miro living from 1893 to 1983. Okay. Um, and let's take a look at some other arts very briefly. Okay, and by the way, there's bull's head. Sorry, I forgot to put that. There's handlebars in the seat. Looks like a bull. Uh, here is obviously one of uh, Salvador Dali's most famous artworks, right? So surrealism, right, has aspects of reality in it, uh, but without, uh, uh, but unlike Cubist, right? Cubism really distorts the, the, the kind of objects that are real, whereas in surrealism, uh, they're distorted, but they're still recognizable, right? Uh, and here you have Magritte, uh, a little more kind of just like putting objects into positions that you don't expect them to be, 
right? And then here is uh, a Joan Miro, which uh, there is a little maybe a little more abstract than the other two, right? Okay. All right. Uh, one of the most influential art events in the history of art. Um, uh, let's write that down. We need to know that. This, it, it, it's giving me the impression that they really care about this. Uh, events in art history takes place in Germany between the two world wars. Right. Um, and that is the, the creation of the Bauhaus School of Design. Uh, and that's going to really influence all modern architecture and art and, and frankly, like just living, right? Uh, which becomes, a, if they say, byword of modern design, right? Uh, they create standards of design and architecture. That would pretty much influence all of the world of art, right? Um, and they're trying to reconcile uh, the kind of mass manufacturing of industrialism with aesthetic form. Um, so uh, reconcile uh, industrial mass production uh, with uh, uh, aesthetic form, right? So, so even though you know the the modern world requires this idea of mass production right we, we can still create art through mass production right um and the main idea there is just form is second to function right so function is the most important right you should not give up function for form um and should also be true to the materials used right so don't try to uh, warp the materials you have into something that they cannot necessarily do or they are not functioned to do, right? Um, and so they designed a curriculum, right? The, the faculty at the Bauhaus design, uh, the Bauhaus school designed a curriculum uh, that heavily influences art today. Right. Um, uh, the school is closed by the Nazis in 1933. Again, it was a literal school, right? Um, and then uh, many of the uh, many of the faculty moved to the United States. Uh, moved to the U.S. to to continue to teach. Uh, the Bauhaus School. Um, and we still see the, uh, the influence of the Bauhaus with the streamlined furnishings uh, and buildings that we have to this day, right? They will influence a lot of future architecture as well. Um, and the man that they bring up here as kind of the major, one of the major professors of the idea is Joseph Albers. Uh, who will live from 1888 to 1976. And let's take a look now at one of his pieces, uh, or like not necessarily one of his pieces, but an example of the Bauhaus style, right? Very simple, right? Very streamlined, but also very pretty, right? It has a, has a lot, of, lot of design put into it, right? Um, and so that's going to do it for the modernist section. Uh, we're not done with modern art, of course, uh, but we are we are rapidly approaching the end here. Uh, in the next session, we'll talk more about abstraction and abstract expressionism, uh, which is probably the last really, really tough section. And then we'll get into pop art and earthworks and stuff like that. Uh, but this is, uh, I think, I think the modern section is incredibly difficult just because there's so much talked about and there's so many different styles of art talked about. Right. Um, it's really hard to wrap your mind around. So hopefully we can kind of get through that. Um, again, we have the Favis with Matisse, which is all about color. We have Cubism, which is all about kind of uh, uh, creating the, the multiple perspectives that the eye sees within an artwork uh, by Picasso and Brock. Uh, we see, uh, <laughs> excuse me, we see Expressionism, uh, which is trying to emphasize emotional response in people with the De Bruca movement and the Der Blau writer of 
Kandinsky, Malovich, and Mondrian, and DeBrucka with uh, Kirchner and Nold. Uh, and, and they are, right, they, they are trying to make the inner workings of the mind visible in art. Right, we have the movement of the Armory Show. Uh, we have the Harlem Renaissance of Jacob Lawrence and Romare Bearden. Uh, and then we also have uh, the Dada movement led by Marcel Duchamp, uh, who helps create Luke and Fountain, and then also invents ready maids that Picasso uses. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we have uh, the Surrealists uh, who try to portray the inner workings of the mind with Dali, Magritte, and Miro. Um, I skipped over the abstract uh, aspects of Kandinsky, right, uh, which had paintings without any subject, right? And then finally, the Bauhaus movement, which is all a movement of design and, and simplicity in architecture and design, right? Um, so yeah, hopefully that is somewhat of a better look at this the modern art styles, uh, but until the next time.